Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We've got a great guest all the way from Indianapolis, Indiana. Welcome to the show, Kent Ritter. Thanks, Victor. Appreciate you having me on. Great to have you here. Well, Kent, you've been at this game a little while, and I'm really keen to go into some details about the way you're managing your properties. But before we do, I'd love to get a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey. Yeah, sure. So I started out my career as a management consultant. And uh, really, just as a management consultant, what you do is you you fly around the country helping businesses solve problems that they can't solve themselves. And so that really was a just a, a fantastic masterclass in, in what makes businesses work and what makes businesses fail and uh, a lot more on what makes them not work, right? Because nobody calls us when things are going well. But it was just a, a fantastic way to see hundreds of different businesses and how they operate. And, and, and like I said, what works and doesn't work. And you start to see common themes evolve. And I bring that up because I think that's been really a fantastic kind of segue in, into what I do now, which is apartment syndication and buying large apartment buildings, because really a lot of the skill set is the same. I mean, these are businesses that, that we're purchasing. A lot of these businesses have been there for 30 or 40 years. And once you understand the levers to pull to, to really make them hum, uh, it can become kind of a rinse and, and repeat process. And so that's really how, how I got to be uh, somewhere in there. I actually started my own consulting firm with a few partners. We sold that at the end of 2015. I'd say that's what really kicked off my real estate career in earnest after selling that company, taking that capital and deploying it into real estate, really started out as, as a personal project, really a way to diversify and fell in love with real estate and fell in love, fell in love with finding deals and the transactions and, and, and seeing the, just the kind of tactile nature, the, the physicality of like seeing the property improve in front of your eyes, right? Something you could really touch and feel. And uh, yeah. And then so started investing with others. And then in 2019, uh, started leading my own deals. From there, we've, we've gone through and we've, com we've acquired eight properties. Now we are just continuing to scale up the company and, and continuing to build out our process and acquiring properties throughout the Midwest. I love that perspective and I love that approach. It resonates strongly with me. And one of the things that I love about seeing lots of different businesses and people talk to me, they say, Victor, how can you have your hands in so many different businesses? And the answer is very simple. It's, well, they're kind of all the same. It doesn't matter what the business is. Like you said, it's a lot of the same levers come mm -hmm. into play. It's the makeup of the team. It's all of those core things that if uh, one of the critical items is missing, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely right. So today you're in the Midwest, not an area that a lot of investors focus on. There's not necessarily a ton of new construction going on in many of those markets, although there's some. What has been your focus? Yeah, so we made the strategic decision to to stay in the Midwest versus kind of chase the, the hottest markets, uh, you know, around rather than go and compete in the southeast and and out in Arizona, and uh, and we did that because we felt like we could really, I could really own my backyard here. Grew up here understand the market well, and felt that we could really uh, carve a niche here uh, and really avoid a lot of a lot of the competition and and find really steady cash flowing properties. I mean, we, we invest for cash flow first and the Midwest is, is a great place to find find those cash flow deals. And so that was why we and, and honestly just the the strategic nature of providing investors with geographic diversification. If everybody is investing in the same markets, then there, there's no diversification there. So if I can provide another opportunity, I mean, a lot of investors come to me because of that. They say, hey, look, I'm, I'm really heavily weighted in Dallas and Atlanta and Jacksonville, and but I don't have anything in Indianapolis. And so for those reasons, we, we decided to uh, really hone in on the Midwest and, and really own our backyard. From a property standpoint, we focus a lot on what I would say, staying under that institutional level, staying under 200 units, again, to avoid a lot of the competition, avoid the players that have just different capital stacks and can frankly pay more because their expectations are less from a return standpoint. I mean, I, I spent 
a while working at a multifamily private equity firm who who got their capital from the large institutions. And it's just, it's just a totally different game. It's just different expectations. And so, so we didn't want to compete with those types of firms. We wanted to stay under that radar. So we stay really under 200 units. And many of our properties are in, you know, the 50, 30, 50 to 70 unit range. And because of that, you know, those are a lot of the properties that, that, People, if you if you're going through some of the the programs to learn how to be a syndicator, and a lot of the programs say, you know, don't touch those properties, stay above 100 units. And again, because of that, I think we can not go with the flow. We could take it a different direction, and we can find value because of that. And we have. That's very interesting because it's one of those areas, like you said, that a lot of investors shy away from. We stay away from it as well for a lot of reasons. Number one. If you're below even 75 to 100 units, it's difficult to dedicate resource. You know, you're going to be dealing with a fraction of a property manager, which means you don't really have eyes on the street, boots on the ground on a daily basis, which depending on your property can be important. That can affect the quality of the management at the end of the day. So what have you done to make that work? Because it's not something that naturally works on its own. Yeah, you know, we've we've had to be creative and come up with some new ideas. Yeah, the uh, the old way of just sitting a property manager on site and and paying full payroll for a forty hour work week doesn't work on those properties. And so, we've developed a model where it's more of a of a pod like structure where you have you know if you have multiple properties that can all be managed by by the same group. We've worked with our property manager who we've partnered with to develop more of a kind of a variable model versus having fixed payroll. So we'll pay a higher management fee, but have no payroll cost allocated directly to the property. And that way we can, we just don't have to have that, that payroll load on the expenses. And it allows us to, I think, be more flexible. We've been able to develop a, a model where like more of a pod structure, if you have several properties that are fairly closely located, then they can all be managed by the same team. And you, you get that scale that you would have on a single property. They just happen to be a little farther apart. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I and mean, we did that, for example, in Philadelphia in the core of the city where we actually did a lot of new construction, but we did it all within a 10 block radius. Mm -hmm. So that even though we might have a 10 unit building over here and a 13 unit building over there and a nine unit, we could effectively manage it as if it was a single building, even though they might've been a few doors apart or a few blocks apart. Yeah, exactly. And so if you get creative, I think you can you can solve the problem. And I think if you can solve the problem, that's how you create a ton of value on these properties, because 100% the hardest thing about a property that's under 100 units is, is how do you manage it? And then, I mean, first of all, just how do you find good management? A lot of the large property management firms, the professional firms won't touch them just because for the same reason, right? Their, their overhead's too high to take on a smaller property. We've been, I mean, through my network, I've been very lucky to find folks that are like me, folks that have been, you know, have, have started a property management company and they're, they're a few years in, right? And they're growing and they're ambitious and, and they're smart folks that come from larger, larger firms, but now they're out on their own and we've been able to partner with them and, and grow together. And so I think we've been able to create a very symbiotic relationship in, in that way. We found quality management that's willing to manage some of the smaller properties. We've come up with a unique model on how to manage. We've come up with some unique contracting on, on how we are actually, you know, the expenses that we're putting toward the property and how we're doing that. And a big factor in all of this is technology and just leveraging the technology that exists now that allows you to better manage from afar and, and have eyes on property and ears on property and without having to, to physically be there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that we make very liberal use of very rich network of security cameras, uh, mm -hmm. cameras that are available to all of the owners, not just a security company. So you really get a sense for what's happening from a boots on the ground perspective. For example, yep. you know, I have properties in Louisiana. I'm thousands of miles from Louisiana. And yeah. yet I go there every day without necessarily physically having to be there. Yep. And, and that make that makes it possible. Now, one of the problems with smaller properties as well is they cannot compete with the amenities arms race. They, mm -hmm. You simply can't amortize a swimming pool and tennis courts and all of these other things over a small number of units doesn't make financially make any sense. Yep. So automatically you're positioning the property a little bit below some of those other 
Class B and Class A properties because of those lack of amenities. How do you compete without just dropping your price? Well, I think you just have to understand you're never going to be the top of the market. And so you just have to understand where you are in the market. You have to, and you have to operate your property in that way. But we may never be the highest. On the other side, though, on, on these properties, I'll tell you when we acquire them, there's way more meat on the bone than going and buying one of those 200 unit well amenitized properties, right? So when we buy these properties, I mean, one of the analyses that we look at is we look at general affordability, right? What's the, what's the rent to income ratio? And then we look at where is it now, but where can we take the property realistically based on where the comps are? And is the property still relatively affordable after we make the increases and do the improvements that we want? Because I mean, oftentimes these properties will be three to $400 below the newer, well amenitized 200 unit property down the street. And so if I can come in and I can raise rent by adding value to hundred to $200, there's still a nice gap that exists between the properties down the street Adding on top of that, if it's relatively affordable and, and one of the more affordable properties in town, then that creates a high demand. And so we've, uh, you know, we've done very well with that model, not trying to be the nicest, shiniest property in town, but coming in with solid workforce housing that's clean and efficient and modern and safe and kind of being able to sit in that second tier with a nice gap to another property that's, that's larger, maybe has a pool and fitness center and tennis courts and all those things. And one of the, one of the interesting facts that, that I learned working for a larger firm that had about 15,000 units was, you know, only about 5% of the residents actually used any of those amenities. They de- it's definitely a buying decision. They definitely make buying decisions based off those amenities, but, but they don't really use them all, all that often. So I think the people that, that recognize that and say, well, you know, I'm actually never going to use that. I, I think they, they like the value in a property that we offer. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Kent, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? You just go to kentritter.com and uh, you can find my podcast there, which is called Ritter on Real Estate. It's a weekly show. You can find my blog. We've got investor resources if you're interested in, in passively investing. Um, but yeah, that's my home base. Fantastic. Well, I love what you're doing and doing it in a part of the country that is not necessarily the most sought after, but you're doing it in a very solid market. So I love that. And for the listeners at home, definitely connect with Kent at kentritter.com. In the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.